Cool. So welcome back, everyone. Um, so we're just going to pick up where we left off on Tuesday, talking about low-fidelity prototyping. Um, it's, again, going to probably be fairly obvious, a lot of this to you guys and stuff, but we're going to cover it. At least we're covering it in half the time that we used to, so we can focus more on the programming and stuff that you guys would have expressed an interest in spending some more time on. So hopefully it's all good. This set of lectures, when I used to teach this course, was a lot longer, but we've shifted the vast majority of it into Anthony's design course because, frankly, it was sort of stepping all over that anyway. Um, so we're just going to go into it. If there's anything that uh, you don't understand or you don't feel like we've gone in enough detail about, do feel free to sing out. Um, but there is a good chance that you'll probably cover at least some of these topics in much more detail. But I wanted to, your first assignment, uh, which I will potentially drop the bomb on uh, at the end of this class or some, some point in this class, uh, will be basically around some of these low fidelity prototyping. It is the lowest marked thing of the three or the, worth the least amount of marks perhaps. Um, so don't stress too much about it. It's really just, again, as I said, all the assignments in this course are to force you guys to actually get your hands dirty rather than just listening to me talk and walking out of the room and forgetting all about it. Um, so we're going to talk, start with paper prototyping. So we talked about this a little bit on Tuesday. Um, paper prototyping is just basically putting anything on paper. So it's quick and simple means of uh, sketching interfaces. So oftentimes, again, I mentioned these slides do tend to be sort of somewhat heavily focused on um, technical things like uh, software and user interface and stuff like that, mainly because that's where my expertise lies. But um, obviously it doesn't, it doesn't have to specifically be interfaces. You could be sketching a physical product. You could be sketching um, some sort of workflow for doing things. Um, using office materials, so we have tons of office materials. If you need anything, talk to Mel. She's got cupboards galore full of bits and pieces. Um, but as we talked about on Tuesday, the good thing about paper prototyping is that it's um, easy to criticize and quick to change. So if you're spending lots of time working on something, the likelihood that you know, a client or whatever is going to be like, oh, actually, I don't really like this, rather than feeling sorry for you because you spent a lot of time on it, um, so, you know, we, we want to spend less time so we make sure we're on the right path to start with. And it's quick to change as well. It's not like we've con constructed this beautiful elaborate thing and we have to tear it all to pieces and go again. So paper prototyping is a creative process and it really helps to develop in teams, particularly in brainstorming and stuff like that. Uh, you know, if, if you're working in a group, um, have someone writing down ideas or have everyone writing down ideas. Don't just leave it up to, oh, we'll talk about it and hope that we remember it. Put everything down on paper, even if it's a matter of like what Rob did with you guys on Monday. Uh, just write down ideas, stick them up. You can worry about where they fit, how to classify them, all that sort of stuff to start with. But just like when you're doing user studies, record everything. You can always throw it out later if you, if you need it, but if you've forgotten it, it's gone forever. Um, so it can be used for usability tests as well. So if you are um, what, looking at interaction, you can do that in a way uh, to explore it. and probably doing a terrible job explaining this, so I'll give you an example instead. So we had a PhD student uh, several years ago now, and she was doing, uh, I guess, probably applied gaming for, um, I'm not 100% sure who she was targeting, but it was sort of like uh, around geology. So it was a, a game where you basically were going out acting as a geologist and you were doing things like recording um, levels of geysers and stuff to see, you know, is there an increase in volcanic activity or any of these other things. And so she, what she'd done, and I thought this was really great, again, I can talk about this one because I did her user study. Um, she had printed very early on, like before she had actually done anything, she had jumped on Google Images and stolen a bunch of images and just sort of printed them out. So she had a 3D game engine background, she had stolen some pictures of like geysers and stuff and just like photoshopped them in. You know, it looked like she'd spent about five minutes on it, but that was exactly, you know, the idea. She wanted to get through it quickly. Um, and then she was trying to figure out the, the user interface, like what tools do people need, uh, how best to design it so that people uh, find it intuitive and stuff like that. And so what she did, as she just went on, um, you know, there's tons of uh, free websites 
uh, like Icon Finder and stuff like that, where you can basically get user interface elements like that other people have made. Some of them you have to buy, some of them. Yeah, Shutterstock, all that sort of stuff. Um, and she just printed out a ton of widgets, cut them out on paper. And she would sit people down and uh, depending on which, she sort of mixed up the, the uh, order of experiments, but you know, you might sit down and she had already laid it out with a proposed interface and she'd be like, okay, here is your task. Um, you know, you need to uh, go over to this place and take these measurements and blah, blah, blah. And she, she would sit beside you and you would be like, okay, um, so I need to go to this place. So I'm going to open on the map. And so you tap on it to imitate a click or whatever. And then she would sit there and she would say, okay, move some elements off and put some elements on. She was basically acting as the computer with the user interface. And the good thing about that is, one, it meant that she didn't have to do any work beforehand. Like she didn't have to program anything. She didn't have to develop it. But she also didn't have to do any user interaction studies or anything like that beforehand. Because if I was like, oh, I need to go there, um, I'm going to click up the top because you know I've used some other piece of software and if you click at the top it brings down a map, she could just be like, okay, and put the map on there and her system, her user interface would behave because it was a, a talk, talk aloud. So you know, you'd be like, oh, well, in you know, Apple Maps or blah, 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 if I swipe down from the top, the map will come up. So she would be like, okay, and just slide the map in and be like, great, rah, rah, rah. The chances of her trying to predict all these behaviors that people were likely to do beforehand was probably pretty slim. And thus being able to program it, computers are intrinsically dumb and that they only do what we tell them to do. So if she had said, oh, we want it to be able for people to swipe down from the top to bring up a map, it never would have done it. So by her sitting there pretending to be the computer and she offered no, unless you're like, I'm really stuck, I don't know what I'm doing. She offered no feedback. She would just sit there quietly and you'd say, oh, I'll bring up the map, I'm gonna swipe down. And she would just put the map and swipe it in from the top of the screen. And by doing that across you know, 30, 40 people, she ended up with this, and she recorded everything, and then she'd go back and take notes over everything. She ended up with this sort of consensus set of this is what people do, this is how they expect it to, the user interface to behave. And then for other people, she would come in and um, she would ask them to design the thing themselves. She'd, she'd be like, here are all these widgets, where would you put them? Oh, okay, well, I put the mini map in the bottom left hand corner because I play a lot of first person shooters and that's where it often is and I put this here and that there. And then again, do consensus, this is where most people tended to put various items. And then from that, 30, 40 people go through, take the, the largest consensus and say, this is how I'm gonna design the user interface because this is what most people seem to want. You could probably build a user interface which would satisfy everybody's wants and needs, but it might be incredibly confusing and unintuitive, but at least this way, it's got the max, maximum bang for a buck. This is what most people expect how it's gonna work. Um, so yeah, paper prototyping used to test out, used a lot to test out com concepts before the real design begins. So this is a similar example. This isn't uh, the PhD student I was talking about before, but this is a very similar idea. Um, so we have here, I believe looking at this, this is supposed to be a um, email program or something. And somebody has been tasked with setting up a rule. So anytime I get an email from you know, Adrian, I want it to go into the trash because he sends a lot of spam. And so they're asked, being asked to walk through this uh, tutorial or walk, walk through this process and somebody's sitting there swapping out slides. So you can see in the background, um, these came from a, a book and unfortunately they zoomed in. It would be quite nice to have a bit more context, but you can see the from line contains people, the subject line contains specific words, message body, blah, blah, blah. And so you can imagine this is halfway through the process, they're setting up this rule, and they, they click, they say, okay, I'm gonna tap on that one, and then the designer would put the piece of paper in front of them, and then they'd say, okay, select the color for your messages. Okay, I wanna change it, so I'm gonna tap that arrow, and then they put in the little drop-down box and stuff. And that way they're able to work through this flow, see is, is it intuitive, um, does it make sense, do people have any comments or criticisms before they've spent a huge amount of time in it. I mean, you can imagine, doing up an interface like, okay, with the backgrounds, possibly slightly more detailed than a, a first pass, but these sorts of widgets, you know, they're like five seconds per widget, just a box and write some words on it. And similar thing here, if you're designing something, um, so this is some sort of paint program by the looks of it, we've got uh, zooms and pen and flood fill and eraser and move, you know, just put them on and with little handles so that you can easily move them around on the screen. So here's a, a real world example. 
um, of paper prototyping. So this was, uh, I don't know the story 100%, but from my understanding, it's something along the lines of um, this company was looking at uh, sort of desktop or web-based interfaces. Um, so we're talking VR or ML, which is probably pre some of you guys, but it's basically 3D on the web um, for car sales or whatever. And so this is back in the days, as you can tell by the fact that this looks like it's been printed out on paper with a hole punch and everything, um, that they wanted to test uh, how people would expect to interact with a 3D model on, a, we're using a 2D interface. So laptops, computers and everything are intrinsically 2D. I have a two dimensional screen, I have a mouse which is two dimensional, I can move it left and right, up and down and I can click. I can't move it in 3D and stuff. And then we're interacting with a 3D model, which is 3D by its very nature. So back before, you know, people play, there was like lots of 3D games out there, people were more familiar with interacting with 3D content, you know, this was quite a big challenge. How do we design an interface which allows people to interact with 3D content using an intrinsically 2D interface? And so they printed out these sheets or perhaps had it on the, um, on a computer. And what we're, what we're seeing here is basically they have this job rotate car in its X uh, axis, which for some reason is top to bottom, but let's just say, let's not argue that. So in its X axis, rotate it from zero degrees to 45 degrees. So we want to take the car from looking like that to looking like that. And what all of these lines and squiggles on this is what everyone has done. So they basically amalgamated everyone's responses and drawn this on the diagram, because this is a really nice way to visualize how people have done this. So you can see there does seem to be a fairly large consensus of people doing a drag from the front of the car to the back of the car. As you would expect, it's quite, you know, people will try and, um, when they're looking at a new interface, they will try things that they're familiar with um, from previous interfaces. So if I'm looking at this phone, perhaps I'm gonna grab it by the corner and twist it around. And so a lot of people have done that. They've looked at this and they said, okay, well, if I need to turn the car from here to here, I'll grab it by that front corner and I'll twist it around. You can see there is a lot of lines which are going in that direction. The red dots indicate clicks. So some people who perhaps were more familiar with uh, user interfaces thought, oh, if I click to the left, I can probably shutter it around a piece at a time. Um, some people have clicked uh, on the right hand side, I guess, thinking similar idea, but in the opposite direction. If I click on the right hand side, it will pull it towards me. Other people think if I click on the left hand side, I'll push it away from me. Uh, then there's some really weird things. Some people obviously just didn't understand it and have clicked on this image. Um, there's pe people who have swiped completely off the image in, in its entirety, but that's okay. You're, as I said on Tuesday, you know, some people just can't be helped. Um, so we're just gonna ignore these outlier cases if there's only a few of them. And we can see from here, there does seem to be a general consensus of grab it by the front and twist it around. Likewise, they had this other task, rotate the car 45 degrees through the X axis that way, and then 20 degrees in the Y axis. So sort of twist it down that way. And again, you can see a fair consensus that most people have thought of this as let's grab the top of the bonnet and pull the car down. You know, they're, they're react, relating this, their real world experience of grabbing something and twisting it to clicking with a mouse and pulling it. Um, again, some people have clicked over here. One person clicked down here for some reason. But, you know, there does at least seem to be enough of a consensus that we can say, well, if we make it that you click and drag, we're probably going to capture 60, 70, 80% of, of people. So then they made the mistake of being like, what about these other people? Um, can we can we make it easier for them? So they're like, okay, well let's throw some buttons on the side because a few people seem to be clicking on the outside. You know, maybe we should account for that as well. Um, so now we've got uh, these buttons around the outside, and again, you know, you can imagine to get from prototype one to prototype two is a couple of minutes worth of work. They just stuck some arrows on the, on the outside, um, but yet it allows us to test one one variable quite thoroughly. Um, so yeah, they cha they've changed it now, so they have these buttons on the side, and we have quite a lot of clicks now, rather than drags. So on the last one, you know, there's only sort of a handful of red dots. Here, there's quite a lot of red dots. A lot of people seem to be in agreement that clicking on this side will turn it, which kind of makes sense. You know, if we have a scroll bar at the bottom of the page, clicking on the left scroll bar usually makes everything sort of scroll that way. 
Uh, some people seem to disagree, clicking on the right hand side. Okay, I can understand the logic behind that. Some people clicked on the, appear to have clicked on the right hand side and dragged because they think you know, that's rather than a, a one time interface, it's a, it's a one dimensional interface, you can click and drag on it. Um, for some reason lots of people have clicked in the bottom corners. Uh, people are still clicking on the car. There's a couple of people who clicked in the top corners and then there's this person here who's clicked and dragged right across the entire interface. And likewise when we do the same thing, there seems to be a large consensus of people clicking in this bottom corner, which seems counterintuitive to me because there seems to be more people clicking this side. So it seems in the left image everyone agreed if you want to turn it, rotate it that way, click on this side, but then in the second image, people like, if I want to turn it that way, you'd think you'd click this side, but for some reason they're clicking this side. So um, looking at this, I would say there is less consensus. People seem to be more confused by this user interface. Um, there's a lot less, you know, there are still people dragging, but there's a lot less dragging compared to this one. So okay, let's try, have a third crack at it. Um, people like to drag, let's not encourage, discourage that, let's not put them off that. Um, Let's not put it, put the, the clicking interface so close to it because it seems to make people think that they can't drag anymore. So let's move the, um, move the click interface for those who like to click away and keep the drag interface for there for the people who like to drag. And we end up with this abomination um, where now we have a bunch of arrows down the bottom which sort of are loosely related to the orientation of the car. Uh, we have some people clicking and dragging off the front. We have a lot of people not exactly sure how this works. So the, some, some of them seem to, probably a similar amount, seem to have clicked on the left arrow as there, as on the left arrow there. Um, but yeah, just a shambles. So from these three very quickly prototyped interfaces, we can see that this is arguably the best one. Yeah, some people aren't gonna get it, but at least the majority of people seem to be in some sort of agreement, whereas here, and even worse so here, people are just clicking wherever to hopefully get some sort of reaction out of the system. So paper prototyping, uh, it's quick and dirty, which is really good uh, for prototyping. We don't want to spend a lot of time on stuff, particularly early on in the process. Uh, there's no software or really any expertise needed. If you can hold a pen, you can paper prototype for the most part. Uh, and it's very inclusive as well. So I did have a slide on this. It must have accidentally got the chop. Um, so one thing which is really good to do in prototyping is to get the uh, user involved very early on uh, and part of the reason for that is because we want them to feel like an active stakeholder in the system. If we're designing for some, someone and we keep this sort of separation between us and them, it's much less likely that they're going to be adoptive, it's much less likely that they're going to provide useful intelligent feedback because they're just seeing it as, oh, well I've hired you, you do all the work. And if you don't deliver the solution they're like, oh well you didn't understand. But if you can get the um, your client, or your sorry, your yeah, your client in on the meetings. Get them to talk through things. Get them to brainstorm. Get them as involved as possible. Almost have them on the team. Then they can you know provide a lot of feedback earlier on. They can provide their provide their own um, ideas for it. They can very quickly sort of realise that I actually haven't explained this very well. The stuff that you guys are doing is not really what I want. We need to focus on this as well. So being able to include. Um, you know, the, the good thing about paper prototypes is you can very easily get a client in. It's not like building a piece of software, building a physical thing where you need a certain set of skills that your client may not possess. Um, you can get them along and get them engaged as well. Uh, the cons, lack of context and scale. So context is, really depends on what you're trying to do. So again, if we're building this MRI interface, um, it might not be that easy to do paper prototyping in the MRI room or you know, the stuff we're designing may not necessarily be, uh, make sense in that, in, the, in that environment. I'm struggling to think how you would, what aspects of the MRI system you could be prototyping on paper, but you know, if you're, you're perhaps just drawing, okay, this is, you know, the person's gonna lie in the bed and they're gonna have this thing on their head. It's very different doing that there than doing it in the hospital with a real patient. Um, and scale as well, paper prototyping, it's quite difficult to look at a large overall thing. It's very good at looking at small, like one-off interactions, how do we rotate this car, um, how do we set up this rule, 
but looking at a larger overall system suddenly becomes quite often quite tedious. So it's very good early on, but it sort of becomes a sort of thing that unless you're focusing on one very small uh, aspect or um, variable in your system, you probably will start to do it less and less the further you go. Potentially hard to share. So there are lots of tools and stuff out there now so this, which allow sharing of paper prototypes and we'll look at one soon. Um, which, but yeah, so if you have like thousands of pieces of paper and you've got a co-located team, so you've got a team here, a team in Australia, a team in the States, wherever, it's quite hard if you've just got thousands of pieces of paper to really convey that as opposed to like a website or something where you can just send them a link. As I said, we'll talk about some, uh, some software examples which have been designed to try and work around that. And it still needs a separate documentation step as well. So some prototypes are to an extent self-documenting. Because of the, the lack of time that we spend on paper prototypes, we don't really want to do a lot of documentation where possible. Uh, which does mean that, you know, if you come back and revisit it six months, a year later, to try and uh, explain it, if you haven't, you know, provided any documentation, you might be struggling to do so. Um, so moving through, does anyone have any questions about any of that? No? Cool. So moving through to paper pro prototyping with hardware. So this is sort of just, I guess, an extension of paper prototyping more than anything. Um, so the HIT lab tends to be uh, more on the technical engineering side of things and as such a lot of the stuff we're building involves some sort of physical aspect, be it a mobile phone, be it a computer, be it a virtual reality headset, be it a robot, you know, something that, um, you know, there is a physical aspect to it. We don't do so much in the web design thing and stuff like that, although arguably web design still is useful to have the context of a computer there. But because we're doing that, sometimes it's actually good to be able to test these paper prototypes with a little bit of context being, you know, particularly with devices like mobile phones, headsets and stuff, the actual physical hardware. Um, so paper prototyping with hardware allows you to experiment with tangible aspects of your solution. So we'll, I'm pretty sure, um, for, some, for some reason I've lost my presenter view, but um, we do have, I th hopefully in a few slides, um, an example, a really nice example of that. But we're looking at things like if we're designing a new piece of hardware, for example, we can both test out the physical design of the hardware and possibly some user interface elements of it as well. So I, if I'm building a new phone, I can cut out a piece of wood or something the size of that new phone and then just stick pieces of paper on it. That allows me to inter, like test both the, you know, the visual aspect and the user flow aspect, but also more tangible aspects as well. So um, I hit the laugh. The, so I have an iPhone 6, which is pretty old now, but for, what was it? There was some, Apple did some advertising campaign talking about how, you know, they had designed it with the, the user in mind and that, you know, you can, everything's within easy reach, rah, rah. And then they brought out like the iPhone X or and might have even been the iPhone 8, which is, you know, about another 30% larger. And they're like, ah, oh, your finger goes from here to here, so why doesn't our screen? And then they brought it out and I'm like, well, actually no, I can't actually reach the top of my screen anymore without moving my hand. For somebody like me who, you know, before I go to bed, I like to go on Reddit or something and just have a look through to wind down. It's like constantly if I click on something and then have to shuffle down to click on something at the other end, it's a pain in the ass. And I would like, really like to go back to a slightly smaller phone that I can actually reach everything. And so Apple's solution to that in the end was to just introduce this feature where you can tap the button and everything slides down so I can reach it with one hand. <laughs> And it's like, okay, yeah, that's, that's kind of a nice feature to introduce. But you literally just had an advertising campaign where you're like, we designed our phones to fit people's fingers, so we introduced a feature in it so that, you know, people with smaller fingers can now actually use their phone. It's like, I'm getting mixed messages here, you know. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what your point is. Yes, it, it's, it's designed for people, but only people of a certain, with a certain hand size. So yeah, being, doing paper prototyping um, can help alleviate some of that. You're designing a new user interface, just put a piece of paper on it and you can tell very quickly, can people actually reach all aspects of the user interface? Or you're designing something on a mobile phone and you know people are gonna be using it predominantly one-handed uh, because most people do, not 
other than my parents, not many people do two hands on the phone. Um, so, you know, maybe having, if people are constantly doing stuff in the bottom corner, perhaps having the back button in the top corner isn't the best idea. So fortunately, a lot of, a lot of apps these days are embracing a swipe gesture as well. So you can click back up here, but you can also just swipe to get back. Um, so particularly, and this will lead in quite nicely maybe to your assignment. So Niels and I have talked and we've finally agreed on what we're gonna do for your assignment. Um, but things like how heavy is it? Uh, is it going to cause fatigue? So we, I talked about this, um, and this is, yeah, not, again, not something which is necessarily that easy with paper prototyping, but this whole concept that, you, have you guys seen the movie Minority Report? Some of you? Okay, so in Minority Report, Tom Cruise movie, set in the future, they have these, I don't know, genetically modified people or something who are able to predict the future, and so they have this future crimes department, and the, he's a, like a police officer detective thing, and they have these people who are able to predict the future and they can predict, predict crimes, and so they arrest people before they um, commit crimes. Kind of a far-fetched, yeah, it's, it's an all right movie as far as sci-fi goes, but for a long time it was the gold standard of AR because they had these interfaces, you know, they, from these genetic engineered people, they're connected into computers which can read their thoughts. But like when you have a dream, it's all sort of dis disconnected and like bits and pieces when they get these new crimes through, they sort of just have like snippets here and there of what's happening. And so like there's this famous scene where he's got these little gloves with LED lights on and he's standing in front of this sort of holographic interface and he's like swiping through and he's pointing at stuff and doing all the, you know, waving all these gestures around and pulling things forward. And everyone's like, wow, that's so cool. Um, work with that for 15 minutes and tell me how cool you think it is. Like, you know, it's quite nice to just be able to sort of swipe back and forward on my little trackpad, you know, that sort of movement, rather than he's like doing these massive big waving his arms around. You'd probably get super ripped, but at the same time, you know, your first week on the job would be absolutely awful. You'd be so tired at the end of the day having stood there for eight hours waving your arms around and stuff. So how you'd play it, paper it over that, I don't know, maybe hang strings from the ceiling with like post-it notes on it or something, but same thing for devices, you know, you're designing a new device, so, I guess in the last few years, there's been this sudden um, surgence of virtual reality, uh, consumer virtual reality. So it used to be virtual reality devices cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and were limited to industry and academia. Now you can go out for like $500 and buy a Vive, which has much better tracking than they ever used to, um, much nicer displays and stuff. And it's got the little, have you guys used the Vive or anything before? Some of you. So you basically have these couple, they look like kind of like ice cream cones, but they're your, your interaction things and they have like a little touch pad and a couple of buttons and a trigger and stuff. And they're really light. Like they're probably about the same weight as that if anyone wants to pick it up. So they're, you know, nice and light and easy to use. They feel a bit cheap because they're so light. So, you know, there's sort of this counterintuitive, you know, my, my iPhone's made out of aluminium, it feels quite sturdy and robust. The screen is made out of butterfly wings and smashes if you even look at it wrong. But, you know, it feels good and solid. The Vive controllers feel kind of flimsy, but at the same time, you can actually use them for a long period of time without getting exhausted. Whereas if I'm lying in bed holding my phone like this, for longer than about 10 minutes, I'm probably gonna drop it on my face because it's actually surprisingly heavy. Uh, and again, can you use it one-handed when walking? So these are things you need to consider uh, you know, phones, again, can be kind of, everyone texts on their phones constantly when they're walking or playing Pokemon Go or whatever. So being able to use it one hand is good. Uh, but for a more um, relevant example, again, to your assignments, what if you're doing something where somebody has to use this long time, long term? What if you're doing this when somebody has to do it while they're doing something else? So I'm using some device while I'm at work and I need to, you know, be able to use both at the same time. Am I gonna get quite tired? Is it gonna put me off balance, because, which is quite dangerous because of the work I'm doing, all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, there's a f lots of examples of these. So these, you know, slightly higher fidelity prototypes, not actually functional devices, but you know, they're, they're the s same size and shape as what the functional device looks like. This one doesn't even have buttons necessarily. But again, you can do these sorts of interactions where you just stick a piece of paper on it and you can um, you know, prototype out various experiences. You know, you're designing a new app, you just 
put a piece of paper on there and say, oh, I'm going to click on it. And again, you can do all the examples we talked about before with a PhD student designing a user interface with just post-it notes on a device. So this, uh, I have a feeling this is actually from Apple. Um, so they were designing a new digital camera back in the days when digital cameras were a thing and we didn't all run around with 13 megapixel cameras on our phones. And they, you know, this was, this was pretty early on, so there wasn't really a huge amount of consensus on, you know, a digital camera can do a lot more than your standard film camera. Standard film camera, you maybe have zoom and a or zoom focus and the shutter. But with a digital camera, you can look at photos you've taken, you can scroll through them, you can zoom in on the photos, you can delete them, you can do all sorts of extra stuff. So in order to explore this, they basically built something or get, got a plastic enclosure roughly about the size they were expecting these cameras to be. You know, these, these are obviously enormous. You know, this is larger than a pair of scissors, so it's more like a tablet than anything. But it allows you to sort of explore, you know, where would people put these buttons if they were going to be putting, using it? Um, a slightly higher fidelity made out of cardboard or foam or something like that to sort of say, okay, well, we've pretty much nailed down, like, from an engineering standpoint, what this thing is going to be size-wise. Um, you know, we can, we can, the circuit board is about this big and it needs batteries and stuff. The CCD or the CMOS sensor has to be this big, so we need a lens about this big. We can figure out all that stuff out. Uh, we have a display in the back which is about this big and let's just get a bunch of stickers and ask people to stick these stickers on this thing and that way because it's a, a physical device they can prototype it. It's like, okay, well if I'm holding it like this, you know, it looks like they've pretty much decided this is where the shutter button is going to be which makes sense because that's where it used to be on standard cameras but at the same time if I'm taking a photo I don't want to have to like, I, or I want, you know, perhaps the zoom buttons to be under that hand because I'm predominantly going to be using that hand to take photos, so it doesn't make sense to have them over this side, so if I need to zoom, I need to get my other hand in there, which makes it really difficult to take selfies. Um, but yeah, again, very simple prototypes, but very powerful tools to allow us to explore things before we've actually built or designed anything. So this is a, I was, I'm glad I left this in here, I was worried I might have, might have gone Anthony's way. Um, but this is a, a really nice example of Palm Pilot. So Palm Pilot used to be a personal organiser, effectively. Uh, a little bit smaller than a cell phone, couldn't make calls, couldn't play games. So basic, basically think of, you know, a really stripped down cell phone. Um, this is sort of in the 90s, possibly even earlier. They were designing these de computing devices that people could carry around with them. And this, you know, this is in the days when cell phones were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. People don't necessarily want to carry around a huge device. It's, it's kind of laughable how cell phones got smaller and smaller and smaller until about 2000 and then they got bigger and bigger and bigger because, you know, people wanted something which was small would fit in their pocket really easily, but then they brought out these beautiful touch screens and everything and everyone said, oh, wow, I want HD 4K video on my device. I want a really large screen so I can sit on the, sit on the bus and watch episodes of um, my favourite TV show. So I want a really big screen. So these guys, on the other hand, came along at a point in time where everyone's device is getting smaller and smaller, and they're like, well, we need a large enough screen that it's actually useful and usable. So Hawkins, 40, uh, Palm's chief technologist and pilot, the Palm Pilots created, designed one of the first handheld computers, the grid pad. Uh, this was a decade ago from whenever this was, so I think this was early 2000s. It was an engineering marvel, but a market failure because he says it was still too big. Determined not to make the same mistake twice, he had a ready answer when his colleagues asked him how small their new device should be. Let's try the shirt pocket. So, you know, this was primarily designed at business people. So they wanted something that you could put in your pocket, pull out, do stuff on, put it back in your pocket. Retreating to his garage, he cut a block of wood to fit his shirt pocket. Then he carried it around for months, pretending it was a computer. Was he free for lunch on Wednesday? Hawkins would haul out the block and tap on it as if he was checking his schedule. If he needed a phone number, he would pretend to look it up on the wood. Occasionally he would try out different design faces with various button configurations using paper printouts glued to the block. So, okay, probably would have come across like a complete nut job to everyone, but it's a really great, um, you know, study. He, he was designing this interface or this, this device that people were going to use all the time for years. You know, it's, it's not enough to try it once, sit down for five minutes, be like, that's really cool, put it away, walk away. So instead he forced himself to pull out this block of wood and 
touch this block of wood every time you have to do something to make sure that you know after the first use, after the second use, after the hundred, the five hundredth use, it's still not that tedious. And the fact that it's a block of wood is really good because, as it says, you can glue stuff to it, and you'd be like, okay, it's a real pain that you know I have to click through all these menus or whatever to get where I want. I just want from the home screen, tap on calendar, tap here. So we could, before they'd even started building anything, he had the, the size of it, the weight of it, he had the user interface, all the stuff sorted by forcing himself for months to carry around this block of wood and treat it like it was a real device. Which, if you think about it from his, the time he spent prototyping and the cost was essentially zero, really. Um, but he managed to get all this really useful feedback. And the Palm, second Palm Pilot was pretty successful until you know smartphones came out and just completely wiped them out. I'm not even sure if Palm, I think they still exist, but no idea what they're doing anymore. All right, so I mentioned um, there are, oh, I mentioned that, um, let's see if I can open this, that the, uh, it's sometimes hard to share paper prototypes with teams and stuff like that. And I mentioned that there are a few tools out there which have been designed to help with that. Uh, so we're going to look at one of them now. Hopefully this all works. So this is called PopApp. So PopApp is an app that was brought out a little while ago and it is designed to make prototyping uh, mobile user interfaces super easy. So really all you do is you sketch stuff out take a photo of it, click and drag a rectangle, and just say, when I touch this, it goes to that, and so on and so forth. Really, really nice idea. Um, volume on that is off. Oh. Maybe, no it's not. Oh, Jesus. So yeah, take some, draw some stuff, take some photos, and then click and drag a few rectangles, and then you have a, a working user interface on mobile. Um, free app, you can, I'm pretty sure you sign up for an account and you basically save your thing to your account and if I want to share it with anyone, I just send them the link. I tell them to download the app and say, get this, um, download the pop app app and then they can share my interface. Super easy, super quick, allows us to share, um, you know, obviously that allows us to do a lot of uh, user testing rather than me having to sit down with everyone I can send it to a thousand people and just say test my new user interface so that's a really nice little app I would recommend you know downloading it giving it a try if you if you're working in app development it's a really nice way depending on what you guys end up doing it again may not be that useful but but that's okay it's it's you know if nothing else perhaps will inspire you in your projects if there's not a tool you can always build a tool and start your own company selling this tool. You may not be the one who designs the next great virtual reality interface, but you may be the one who designs the tool which allows others to develop the next great user interface. Which is interestingly enough, one of the most common requests my company gets is, we really love what you guys do, how can we do it ourselves? And it's like, well, you can't, because it's really, really hard. Um, but you know, there is a massive, we, we live in a, an era of creators, you know, it's, it's quite an exciting time that all these things have been made to reduce the entry barrier. We have programming languages like processing, we have hardware devices like Arduino. Now more than ever, people can actually make things and it's, it's really exciting and, you know, when you do something new and inspirational, people always, their first question will be like, how can I do that? Um, so yeah, don't... Don't underestimate like creating tools because there is a huge demand for them. Okay, moving forward on storyboards. So this is again sort of, this was something that I was really struggling how much I wanted to include in this uh, because this is getting more into design, but uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's useful. It's potentially useful and something that you guys might want to do in your first assignment. Uh, so we'll talk about it here and I know Anthony's planning on going into more, well, Last I heard, he's planning on going into more detail about it. So storyboards are a sequence of sketches showing the use of the system in everyday use context. God, that's a mouthful. Um, but basically the idea is a sketch, the sketches we've talked about so far sort of uh, stand alone. We draw a sketch, at the very least, you know, we need somebody there to shift pieces of paper in and out to explain stuff. So 
there's no sort of continuum, there's no experience, it's just like everything is standalone. Here is something, look at that, do you like it? Okay, take it away. The idea of sketches is it, or a storyboard is that it's a series of sketches which have some sort of timeline that you know describes an experience or describes a process or something like that. And they tend to be a concrete example. So if I was, for example, uh, designing a new app or whatever and I was wanted to show you guys a storyboard, it wouldn't be like an arbitrary storyboard of, oh, well, here are the screens and if you tap on this, it'll take you here. You can do that, but usually you'll focus on something like, okay, in the new app, you might want to create a new user account. And so the storyboard shows you the process that you will go through in order to create that. And you'll end up with multiple storyboards, each one which tells you know, uh, a concrete example use case through your, through your uh, whatever you're building. Easier and faster to grasp than text-based stories. Um, so I think in Anthony's one, again, he's gonna talk about this, but I, I used to have some examples which were talking about, at least I don't think I have them anymore, um, described a, a system and they, they were called scenarios and for something quite simple like setting up, there were the, an example I had was setting up a projector was about a page and a half of text. You know, quite a lot to digest. Um, whereas, you know, a few sketches can probably sort of explain that. Like they were talking about, he, uh, it was Gunther the ad exec and he would take it out and he would need to find his cable and plug one end of the cable in here. You can basically show a picture of a laptop and a projector and a cable with two arrows and it's like, okay, well that, that's solved that. Um, so the storyboards can be seen as a means of communication with users and system developers. If you're good at this, you can create something that you can provide to a lot of people and they can read and understand. Um, have you guys, anyone seen the movie Office Space? Go, get a copy of it and watch it. It's hilarious, but it, kind of irrelevant, but there's one guy in it. Um, it's, it's set in... Uh, a 1990s software office, they, they make bank software, and it's a very cynical, um, dark comedy view of what it's like to be a programmer in a, a small cog in a massive machine where you have seven different bosses, and it's, it's equal parts funny as it is depressing for somebody who's sort of worked in that field. Um, it's got a young Jennifer Aniston in it, so that's it's always a bit of a laugh to sort of watch it and see her before she, I think it is around the sort of early Friends era, so before she was crazy famous. But anyway, they have, uh, they bring in these guys, they're down, so, or like laying off staff, and they bring in one guy, and he's trying to justify his job, and he's talking about how he takes the specifications from the client and give the, gives them to engineers, and maybe in the, in the break I'll see if I can find that scene, but... Um, Effectively, his entire job would be replaced by a storyboard, and in the end, he gets laid off for that exact reason. Um, spoiler alert. Uh, but yeah, you know, we're basically looking at trying to get people who necessarily don't speak the same language uh, find a way to communicate between them. So I don't mean necessarily language like actual, an actual spoken language, but users will have a very different understanding, a very different set of language and requirements and everything than engineers, tech people who tend to think about things as, oh, well, I need to use this algorithm and that algorithm. And then the person at the other end is like, I just want to click on this button and have it do something. They don't, they don't need to know or care what happens beside, behind the scenes. So storyboards as a, as a designer or a, pro, a prototype of developer allows you a very good way to communicate. And this is something, storyboards and wireframes is something we use constantly in my company because we work with a lot of advertising agencies and stuff who don't necessarily know the first thing about tech but they have a clear idea of what they want to do. And so we will work with them to build storyboards and wireframes so that we can agree on this is what we're trying to build. They're happy with it because they know what's being built. We're happy with it because it gives us a way of telling, you know, this is what we need to do to get to the finish line. Um, again, storyboards should be more on the, the side of sketches, not drawings, depending. Yeah, I mean, that one, that one comes with a caveat. It depends on who you're communicating to. So. For a prototyping thing, you probably want to keep it sketchier, but if it's something that, you know, you're delivering to a client, perhaps you can spend a little bit more time, you know, I'm, I'm differentiating between sketches and drawings here based on the amount of time and the fidelity of it. A sketch is something that you just quickly, whereas a drawing might be something that you actually get somebody who has some artistic talent to make it look nice so that you can present it to your client, depending on what you're trying to test. 
Um, using to test interaction, make sure design works. Oh no, I do still have Gunther in here. Um, so yeah, this is this is part two of Gunther, um, the ad guy, which is talking about. I think this was again from Apple. Yeah, Apple. Uh, back in the day um, when they had, uh, they were they were you know you had the massive big MacBooks and the project in order to sort of try and make it, um, you know, user and user friendly and everything, they basically wanted to design this projector which almost was part of the MacBook really. So you know these days you have these little Pico projectors or whatever that you can almost put in your pocket or you have have one in this room but you have you know, everyone knows what a projector looks like that are generally pretty easy to, easy to set up straightforward plug it in with an HDMI cable and away you go but this is this is well before that and this is um, this is yeah talking a Apple basically or a, a company talking about Apple's new projector idea so Gunther's a, an advertising uh, guy he basically travels around the world and presents advertising campaigns to companies so he's carrying around his uh, compact PowerBook Trio 380 with thousands of colors and a lightweight seven and a half kilo projector um, and a video camera as well. So, you know, he's, he's going around carrying all this stuff, um, probably ends up with a back problem by the time he's in his 40s from it, but that's okay. Uh, so this projector is pretty, pretty swanky. Uh, rather than plugging in a cable, you actually insert your laptop into it. So it slots in there, uh, he plugs in the projector, the whole presentation is on his, his power book, he slides the power book into the built-in dock and it eliminates the need to connect wires between the computer and the projector. Kind of actually a cool idea still, especially if it could power the MacBook, uh, or power, sorry, power the power book, and that you just sort of slot in there. Obviously that means that the projector needs to be enormous, but you know, nice idea. I'm still wondering why wireless video hasn't taken off as much as it should. But then we've got a few other examples. He like, you know, shows some presentation. Uh, he can use his little remote control to step through. And then he can insert a little VHS cassette into the projector because this is before we played videos on our, on our um, devices. But, you know, there's a lot of text in here which sort of explains through it. Uh, less so than, you know, just the page of text I was talking about before. But even if you just look at the top pictures Despite the fact this is fairly antiquated technology, <coughs> uh, you know, you can look at it, okay, here's a guy. <coughs> if, we, if we know that's supposed to be a laptop and a projector, we can say, oh, okay, it looks like the laptop slides in there. Uh, he's doing some stuff on there. He's got a little remote control and he's got, I mean, a VHS cassette. So these things tell a very specific scenario, as I was talking about before, but they tell it in a way that's fairly intuitive and easy to understand. And again, they're quite sketchy. Um, in this case, and again, this is something which we covered more in Anthony, it looks like they've probably, in this case, taken, unless this was a real artist, you could quite easily cheat with this. You take photos, and then you take the photo and you just draw around it to get a nice sketch. And that way you can, you know, show just enough detail to get the point across without, you know, distracting people with background elements and stuff. Um, so storyboards, uh, you can a lot of times take inspiration from camera shots and filmmaking. Uh, which allows you to establish things like context and stuff like that. So in this case, we're looking at uh, someone, again, this is probably more my level of artistic ability, uh, an application which is, you know, perhaps a transit application or something. So we start off with an establishing, Scott, uh, establishing shot, extreme long shot, uh, showing the, the setting, the location stuff. So this person's at a train station, we can tell because this is a train, flat, train tracks, not a ladder which is lying down. You have to take my word for it. Uh, we zoom in a little bit, we see a uh, close context, so we're now someone, this, this girl is using this device. Um, she is this person at the train tracks, we can tell because she's colored a different color than everyone else. A medium shot, uh, which shows the person, perhaps this isn't that useful in this case, uh, but we have an over the shoulder shot, which shows, oh actually, it's not a book she's holding, it's a, it's a device. A point of view shot from her point of view, so that we can see this is the app that she's looking at and then a close-up showing the current state of the interface or something. So this might be, you know, we might use a few of these shots to establish the context. Just as in this way, we have this sort of long shot showing Gunther with all his bits and pieces and then we have sort of a close-up shot showing his thing. We have the over-the-shoulder shot showing what he's doing um, 
sort of more of a close-up shot showing the, the user interface and stuff like that. So sort of just various bits and pieces which will allow us to basically tell a story in an entire story, not just, you can imagine if we just started with this image here, which we might be inclined to do because, hey, we're, we're designing this user interface, we're designing this app, we're not really concerned that this person's at the train station using it, uh, but perhaps it's a trans transit app, you know, she's looking up, okay, I need to catch this train to be at this place at this time. If we just started here, we would have to explain to people, okay, we're building this transportation app. Imagine you have a person who's at the railway station, they're going to catch a train, blah, blah, blah. Or instead, we can throw in like a couple of very quick sketches and we can just do away with all that text. The less text, the better. For the same reason as we talked about on Tuesday, we don't want to, when we're prototyping stuff, we don't really want to tell too much. We want to just sort of give the idea and then look for feedback in the hopes that, you know, if we just show a couple of shot, a couple of things like this, and then uh, if we're showing it to a client for testing or whatever, we can sort of say, you know, can you explain what you understand is going on here? Can you give me some feedback on that? If we, if we give too much detail about it, like we've done here in Gunther, they're just gonna say, oh, yep, that's cool, or no, we don't like it. If we give them something like this and ask them to sort of talk through how they understand it and they, they explain it, they might be interpreting this in a much different way and it might be better than us, or it might be worse than us, or it might just cause us to reevaluate. okay, why have they interpreted this different to what we have? So here's quite a nice way of making storyboards come to life, uh, similar to our hardware prototyping before. So this is a little um, sort of kiosk thing which would be available in an airport. Uh, so you go up, they, they do actually have them in a lot of airports these days, so you can self-check in, yeah. Um, but this is sort of pre, pre that era, so you can go in and you can, you know, to make it super simple rather than having a touch screen, they've just got three buttons effectively. Uh, but in order to illustrate this, they've effectively made a little foam or cardboard version of the thing, and then the storyboard actually slides through it. Pardon me. So you can have a, you know, you're demonstrating it to the user, and they'll be like, oh, I push this button and you just pull the piece of paper through and then they get this thing of oh, sliding interfaces and stuff. It's in the context because they're using it on a replica of the device. Uh, it's self-explanatory, stuff like that. Same thing for smartwatch designs, have a, you know, a little image of the watch that the person can hold and they're like, oh, touch that, slide it through, really gives that experience of, you know, this is how the user interface works before we've actually designed a user interface. How are we doing for time? All right, we'll go through the we'll go through some wireframes and then we'll have a, a short break. So wireframes are something that we use quite extensively. A lot of these things as well, there's, there's a fair amount of overlap between, uh, you know, um, paper prototyping and uh, sketching and storyboards and wireframes. And depending on which, you know, uh, book you read, people will use interchangeable names. Some of them won't differentiate between them. Some of them will say, this one is obviously this, this one is obviously that. It's, it's all a bit uh, arbitrary, really, more than anything. So again, there's no exam for this. So don't expect me to say, what is the definition of a storyboard? What is the definition of the wireframe? Because I wouldn't be able to answer that myself. Um, think of these more as tools that you might like to use and if you go for a job and they're like have you ever used wireframes before you can say yes and just leave it there and not worry. Um, if they try and ask for a definition just do your best. <laughs> Sorry Ned, so uh, do you use wireframes and storyboards interchangeably? Uh, yeah well, I mean that, that's kind of yeah what I was getting at so I think so I mean arguably some of these here so these are these are wireframes again but if you look at these one, in particular this one here, the fact that you know, there is a flow shown by these arrows could be argued that this is a storyboard. Exactly. So you know, I, don't, I don't know where to draw the line because everyone that you talk to will give you a different answer about where to draw the line. Um, I tend to think of wireframes as being more standalone than a storyboard. So a storyboard tells a story, it's kind of in the name. So. I, I say this is how our system will allow you to create a user account. A wireframe, I tend to think more of uh, a design sort of layout sort of thing. So a storyboard will never just be one image, a wireframe could be. So it could just be the front page of our new website, it could just be the, the layout of our new app. 
Um, so they have a very specific, uh, I guess, vocabulary in how they design. So in a wireframe, an image will always be a box with an X through it. That seems to be fairly standard across everything I've seen. So you look at it, see a box with an X in it, you have an image. Hopefully, if you look around, you'll get some idea of what the context of that might be. So here's an example wireframe here. Um, profile name, we have some address. Uh, we have some categories, some text, a little movie player down here, some more images, some attachments. So perhaps this is on a, on a website, you can look up people's profiles. So we can assume that this is probably someone's photo, this is their name, this is their address, this is the things, perhaps if they're a lecturer, these are the courses they teach or whatever, this is a video of them teaching, whatever else. But it gives us an idea of the layout of the page without getting too explicit on any of that sort of stuff. So the wireframe depicts the layout or arrangement of content, interface elements, navigation systems, um, usually lacks type, typographic style, color, graphics, since the main focus lies in the functionality, behavior, and priority of content. So in this, everything is in, I don't know what font, but not a particularly attractive font anyway, but it's kind of the same all across. Things are, if you look at, you know, even the boxes that the image is in are deliberately wavy and sketchy because it, it implies, <coughs> implies a certain lack of completion because we're not wanting to say, we're, we're not wanting to give the impression that this is the finished product. We're more like, do you like how this is laid out? Do you like where everything is? So it focuses on, a, on what a screen does, not what it explicitly looks like. We're not so worried about, oh, I don't like this font, oh, I don't like this color. It's more like, you know, are you happy that this shows everything that this page needs to show? So here's a couple more examples. So this one uh, is showing some sort of, there was a, a website in New Zealand a long time ago called Smile City, which I'm pretty sure is now defunct, but they tried to set themselves as New Zealand's homepage to the internet sort of thing. And you could go on there and you could read the news and you could, you know, have a, communicate with people. It was like Stuff, which is New Zealand's news site combined with um, Facebook, combined with you could do online surveys and get points that you could redeem towards online shopping and all this sort of stuff. Uh, I tried to do too many things and didn't do any of them particularly well and now it's gone. Um, but I have a feeling this is, the idea behind this one is kind of the same thing. So we can see we have a user, uh, a picture, 500 points. We have somewhere they can enter a code, perhaps, you know, this is tied in with various promotional things, you buy 100 liters of fuel, $100 of fuel and you get some code that you can redeem for points. An account summary, you have some perhaps news articles or something which are relevant to you. We have this uh, top set of buttons across the top, so this is screen one. If we click on screen two, we can see we can redeem some points. Perhaps here's a little online shopping sort of thing or, you know, book a holiday, get some, uh, book some flights with your air points, whatever. We have a thing, a third one here, which is a message board, and a fourth one here, which is sort of just other bits and pieces. But from this, you know, again, it's very sketchy. Nothing, a ruler hasn't been used to draw these lines so someone's been drawing them. But very click, quickly, we can sort of get an idea of what's available in this thing. We have a rough idea of layout of each page without explicitly going into any detail. In this case, I've just, you know, chosen to do lines as text so I can look at this and be like, oh yeah, that's, I get the idea of what you're trying to show here. You know, this is perhaps uh, the top three news stories for the day. So we have a, a title, some a blurb, and then a, a photo that I can then, click on to get into. So very quickly describes a, you know, the rough layout of something without going into too many details. Similar thing here for an application, which, you know, as I mentioned before, is almost getting storyboard sort of tech, uh, things because we have this sort of user flow of we click on this and then we go to here and from here we can go to this one. I, I'm pretty sure these are supposed to be arrows pointing down. So from here we can go to here and then we go to one of these two and from those we can go to there. But again, you know, it's, it's specifically vague, like it's designed to be vague, so we can get a rough idea, but we're not going into too much details. So there are tools which allow you to do wireframing, so Balsamic is one which is quite popular. Um, it's been around for a long time, it's still Creating software is hard. It takes a team of people working together to be successful, but the roles involved communicate in very different ways. Creating yeah. software is hard. It takes a team of people working together to be successful, but the roles involved communicate in very different ways. Not having a common language results in problems we've all seen, designs that can't be built, applications that are hard to use, or products that just don't meet customer needs. 
It's like everybody on the team is imagining a different product. Stop imagining and start seeing with Balsamic Mockups. Balsamic Mockups is a rapid wireframing tool that helps you get to the right product together. It was designed to get business people, developers, and designers on the same page before coding starts. Let me show you around by building an application you may be familiar with. I'll start by grabbing a window control and giving it a name. I'll resize it and customize it a bit. Balsamic Mockups 3 has over 75 built-in controls for all kinds of user interfaces. Next, I'll add an image placeholder for the album art. Now I'll add some text. Notice how it snaps into place at preset distances from other objects. Okay, so I'm just gonna fast forward. I'll use the duplicate this. shortcut to create another button and change the label. <coughs> I'll grab some text that I prepared in advance. Columns in a data grid are defined by separating text with commas. Now for some fine tuning, changing the inside borders, spacing things out a bit, and I'll show the first row I selected and add a scroll bar. I can choose from images that I've already imported, get one from the web, or just drag and drop from my computer. Balsamic Mockups 3 also allows you to create symbols, which are groups of controls that you can reuse across your mockups. Here are some that I created earlier. These custom controls show up in the user interface library just like the rest. You can also download pre-built symbols that other people have created for things like Android, iOS, and Bootstrap. With Balsamic Mockups 3, you can easily wireframe desktop apps, websites, mobile apps, and more. Switch to the wireframe skin for a more polished look and feel. Link your mockups together and use full screen mode for presentations or usability testing. Balsamic Mockups comes in desktop, web, and plugin versions. Download a free trial today. Happy wireframing. So yeah, I mean that's a, a fairly common, um, so commonly used tool is Balsamic. And again, that doesn't really help with our definition of where does a wireframe end and a storyboard begin, because a lot of these tools you'll find kind of do both, um, wireframing and storyboarding. But you know, in the um, in the three minutes that video was, he basically built a a mock-up of the spot, old Spotify um, user interface. And it, it, again, is designed to create and test these wireframes quickly without focusing on things like font alignments and colors. To an extent, he did that in the video, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you should or have to do that. You can very quickly just sort of throw things together and um, you know get a, a rough look and feel for it. All right, let's have a quick break there, and we'll come back at 10 past 11, so I can finish drinking my cold coffee. <laughs> cool, all right. <coughs> so we'll pick up and we'll see how, if we can get through these. Um, LJ, I believe, has another lecture at 12, so we'll try and finish just before 12. Um, cool, so just a, we just talked about balsamic before. Um, there was, I had a, another whole thing about transitions in there, which is sort of, I guess, where things get a little bit confusing between what is a wireframe, what's a storyboard. Um, and I had all these slides, which Anthony will now be taking over. Uh, but we're talking about a transition as kind of being the difference between, well, at least I'm saying, the difference between a wireframe and a storyboard, and that you might have state A and state B being the wireframe, and the storyboard is effectively looking at the transition between them. Um, so how do I get from, for example, here to here? These two are wireframes, but the storyboard would sort of be, well, okay, if I click on two, it'll get me from one to the other. And other people may argue with me, and that's fine. Um, you know, until, until I hear someone come up with a really conclusive argument why one or the other, I'm happy to run with that, and you're certainly entitled to your own beliefs and assumptions. Um, so as part of that, I just wanted to include this uh, little thing. So we saw in Balsamic they had uh, wireframing, as I said, has a sort of uh, quite a, a fairly well-defined vocabulary. So when I say vocabulary, I'm talking about when we design a wireframe, we have 
you know, if we want an image, we have a box with an X in it. And anyone who understands wireframes will say, that's an image, okay, I know that. Um, with, when we're talking about storyboards and then transitions and stuff like that, there are a whole bunch of uh, design patterns as well that we can, we can leverage off. So for example, this is uh, the UI Patterns website. Um, so this is specific for UI, but this is looking at a bunch of common, pardon me, transition sort of patterns. So uh, yeah, patterns, I'm not sure originally where the term came from. I certainly learned about it in computer science when we're talking about software patterns. And basically they are, when we talk about a pattern in software or these user interface design patterns, we're talking about something, a way of doing things which has sort of fallen out of um, experience, really. So in software, it might be, we have these design patterns like, um, I'm trying to think of a, a one which is easy to explain. We have the instance thing, for example. So in software, we might have a, oh sorry, it's called the singleton pattern now that I think about it. We have this idea that we have a piece of, or a collection of data perhaps that there should only ever be one copy of. Um, so we might have the NZI3, or sorry, it's called the John Britton building now, the John Britton building as a, as a, a class or an object in our programming, and there's only ever gonna be one of them. We don't want to allow people to create multiple copies of this building because it doesn't make sense, there is only one. So say we're writing some software which allows us to control the, um, the windows, wouldn't that be lovely? Uh, so instead of basically having a class or an object, and we'll talk about this when we get to programming, which you can create multiple copies of, so I could have multiple software copies of this John Britton building. I have this idea that there is only one and there should only ever be one and I should only ever allow them to be one. And this is a common problem in computer science or programming and basically from the people, I can't remember what their names were, but there was a, a, a group of people who basically looked at a ton of industry projects and found you know, all these different people who had basically come up with the same solution to problems, and then they codified them as this is a this is a programming pattern. The and that in that case it's called the singleton pattern, and it's basically a way of designing your code to make sure that people will never create more than one copy of this object. Um, and so that's called singleton singleton pattern. You can look it up, and it will show you how you can write it, write your software to do that and it solves your problem. This is a problem that people are gonna run into all the time. Someone has already solved it, or actually multiple people solved it, and it was all very similar how they solved it, so we basically said, this is the singleton pattern, if you do this, that will solve that problem. Likewise, these design patterns follow the same thing, where uh, these, you know, you can see they're broken down into various categories, but they are things that a lot of people have come up with the same or very similar solutions, so somebody's taken the time to basically say, okay, this is the password strength meter. So if you want a user to choose a password and you wanna make sure that they choose a password which isn't going to be easily um, guessed or hacked or anything, this is a good way of showing it. And when we look at these, you'll see these are incredibly, you know, you'll be like, oh, I've seen a thousand examples of this. So problem summary, you want to make sure your user's passwords are sufficiently strong in order to prevent malicious attacks. So here's an example, you need a minimum of eight characters, um, you type in something, it says it's weak, it's good, it's weak, it's fair, it's good, it's strong. Um, so when you want your users to choose passwords for the user account that are hard to break, and then there is some more examples, like real world examples showing it. Here's a solution, here's a strong, you know, talks about all the various bits and pieces, and somewhere in here I think they have um, little examples that you can basically steal for your website or whatever. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. I talked about breadcrumbs the other day for if you're designing a website or an app that allows you, if you're three or four sort of links in the change down, for some reason it does not want to load that, um, will allow you to go back. So there's a whole bunch of different patterns in there. If you're, you're trying to design some sort of user interface and you're like, oh, I really, I have this problem that I really, you know, seems like it should be pretty easy to fix, but I'm just not sure the best way have a look through these design user interface patterns because there's a good chance if it, if it seems obvious that someone else has probably had it before and someone else has probably come up with a pattern. And the good thing about using these design patterns is the more, well, people are, are most likely to understand stuff that they've seen before. So, oh, my internet's dropped out, that's the problem. Um, so the, yeah, if you see 
a password strength meter, for example, on you create a new site, you put a password strength meter, chances are that's not the first time people are going to have seen that, so they will immediately understand it. So you follow these and you and 100,000 other websites use it, so it's immediately intuitive to users and stuff like that. Um, okay, so, oh, hold on, maybe. No, cool, oh. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like my internet's back, so command shortcuts, very obvious, it's hotkeys effectively. I didn't deliberately click on this one, I was just clicking on anything. But yeah, there's hotkeys, how to do it. Some of them are more, uh, more or less intuitive. Um, the carousel user needs to browse through a set of items and possibly select one of them. So Netflix and everything has this idea of a carousel that allows you to quickly flick through. Um, you know, tons of different websites use them and as a user, Chances are you've seen it before and you can immediately figure it out. And even if you aren't, these have been, these, these, are, these design patterns come out of probably hundreds, thousands of hours of user, user uh, research and stuff. So someone's already done the hard work prototyping these experiences. You can just nab them and use them because someone else has done the hard work figuring out this works. Um, oh. And just one other thing that I wanted to touch on before we move on out of wireframes and all this sort of more designy stuff is ProtoIO, which Mobile is, another, apps sorry, is a, another thing that some students have found useful in the past. So if you think about this as being the next extension to PopApp. So PopApp, you sketch things out, you take photos of it, you can share it. ProtoIO takes that to the next step. Everything's done on the computer, on the device, but it also allows you a lot more power as a result. Becoming more and more sophisticated. Creating a visual simulation of a mobile app before you jump into production is a must. Prototyping will help you build your app faster and cheaper and with much less risk. The process, however, is often time consuming and frustrating, and it doesn't represent the real thing. Not anymore. Proto.io is a silly fast way to create fully interactive mobile app prototypes. You can create realistic, shareable prototypes that work as your app should. And Proto.io does more than just linking screenshots. Just select the device you want to build a prototype for and start dragging UI components to create visually stunning interfaces in no time at all. Designed specifically for mobile, Proto.io can emulate everything an app can do. Interactive touch gestures, screen transitions, animations, and even orientation changes all without a line of code. And hey, with Proto.io, not only can you preview and share your prototype on the desktop, but you can experience your prototype on the actual device. So whether you're a UX guru, designer, coder, or you just had a great app idea, Proto.io is the best place to start. Sign up now for a 15-day trial and give silly fast prototyping a go. So in some ways it's kind of similar to um, Balsamic and uh, PopApp and stuff. It's just more tailored to, to mobile and as a such, it, it implements a lot of these design patterns that we'd seen, which is sort of specific to mobile um, stuff. So yeah, does anyone have any questions about any of that so far? So hopefully it's all intu fairly intuitive. I know we've sort of rushed through it quite quick, but again, you'll be covering a lot more of that sort of stuff in the design thing. So I really just wanted to sort of touch on it because it is part of the, pro, you know, these are prototyping tools. Um, learning how to use them well sort of comes more in the design than the prototyping though. And plus I want to move on because that's not my area of expertise and I find this stuff, uh, these types of prototyping a lot more exciting and fun than downloading the latest and greatest UX UI design tool. So we're going to just talk about in the, the what's left of this lecture a few of the um, kind of a bit more out there perhaps prototyping tools. I'm not sure what that is. Windows going crazy next door. Um, <clears throat> but some of these, I, so I've, I've touched on these before, but some of these are quite cool, quite interesting. Um, I think vastly underutilized in the, the hit lab often. Some of the, well the Wizard of Ozing, not so much, but some of these other things I think could be really, really helpful. Um, so starting with video prototyping, so video prototyping is sort of what we just saw with Proto.io and stuff like that, but you are basically doing everything with a video camera rather than designing an app. Um, so a series of still photos or video clips demonstrates the experience of the product. Uh, you can also discover where your concept needs fleshing out. 
and communicating the experience interface. And you can use whatever tools. So we had um, one of the assignments that the master students did years and years ago uh, required them to create a video prototype and some of them had just done it in PowerPoint effectively. Like they just done a bunch of frames in PowerPoint and then they just sort of flipped through, but it gave the same idea. So here's a uh, potentially somewhat sexist, so you have to forgive me, I did not make this video. Um, video which sort of illustrates the, the concept of video prototyping. I'm not quite sure. So here we have this concept of a um, mind mapping brainstorming um, application which has been video prototyped. So again, this is kind of similar to the other examples that we've seen before, uh, which talk about, um, you know, when we're talking about designing user interfaces and stuff by just putting pieces of paper on the screen, except this time they recorded that experience. Um, this is you know, probably done by a designer rather than a user, but it allows you to very quickly and understand, very quickly and easily understand, you know, how this app or this interface might work. With again them not actually developing anything, just cutting out some pieces of paper. So yeah, again, slightly sexist, and I, I do apologise about that, but it is a you know a nice example which sort of shows how you can really easily video prototype an experience in a way that allows us to really easily communicate an idea across. So you can imagine the longest part of making that video was probably cutting out the pieces of paper. Um, and yet you could send that to somebody and they could easily, very quickly and easily understand what it is you're, like how it works, how the user interface looks, how the flow works, all these sorts of things. Um, so making a video prototype, uh, decide what type of video prototype you want, stills with voiceover, stop motion with voiceover, live action video. So, you know, it doesn't, if, if you're doing a presentation video prototype, the voiceover doesn't necessarily need to be in there. You could just talk over it like I did talk over, I talked over that video, but if you want to send it to someone, you know, it's probably a good idea to have the voiceover in there. Plan the shoot, make and set up, um, shoot the scenario, and then evaluate and effort. Uh, evaluate and edit. I'm not actually sure what this is showing us. Nope. <laughs> it's all right. So, Here's, a, here's another sort of interesting example, um, which... Is this one? So this is a video prototype that some guys did, I think, in a design thinking course. That This is the German name library e-system. I'm not going to try and pronounce it, um, or it looks German anyway, but the idea is they wanted a, a, an e-system that you go to the library and they, you don't have to necessarily, or maybe even from home, you can find out some information about what books are available and all that sort of stuff on your device uh, or you can get help in without necessarily them having to have a lot of staff at, at the time. Okay. Yeah, so this is probably the more interesting part. So this is your laptop computer as you can tell because it's got a camera and stuff. Um, but this is you know a nice example of video prototyping which shows the live, live assistant part. Welcome to the Gothenburg Library. How may I help you? I'm interested in this author, Hunter S. Thompson. Oh, yes. I, uh, I love Hunter S. Thompson. He's one of my personal favorites. I recommend you trying out... Um, start with... Uh, the Love Diary. Oh, really? Could you tell me a little bit more about that? And maybe Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And then there's this documentary, yeah. Earth with Hunter, it's pretty good. Uh, and then there's this... Well, so a little bit sort of goofy and stuff, but you know, you get the idea in that you go on the website, you can have a, a live chat with someone, and as they're talking, you know, various things will pop up on the screen that you could perhaps click on after the chat and have a look at them. So you get this sort of, li this combined live experience with, you know, the stuff they talk about gives you a user interface which allows you to later go through and explore it. And again, you know, this literally all they did here was cut a hole in a box and have some guy sit behind it with some post-it notes. A very, very simple way to, um, and you know, they've got links that pop up videos and stuff later on. 
So a very simple way to prototype out how this uh, website might work with post-it notes and a box with a hole cut in it. Sorry, did someone? Mm. Yeah, so we, when, we, when, when we get to um, Wizard of Ozing, that's... Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and I mean, that's the sort of thing that before you maybe spend all the time building out this website, you could very quickly test with that and see, is this something that people would actually want to use or whatever. Um, so there's a bunch, these are obviously, the, the examples we've seen so far are obviously very low fidelity, um, but there are some much higher fidelity examples. So here is a little video that somebody threw together for Google Glasses. And you can tell in this, all they've effectively done is um, they got a bit of, you know, After Effects or whatever experience, and they've just gone around and recorded the video with like a GoPro strapped to their head, and then they've just stuck some, you know, in After Effects. Um, some meet me in front elements. of Strand Books. Um, but again, you know, it probably took them a lot less time to put this video together to explain a concept than it did to actually build the Google Glass interface, and it allows you to. Show this to people and say this is what we're thinking. Oh man, really? Hey there, guy. Hey there, little guy. And again, the good thing about this is, Sweet. or one thing which video well, prototyping and stuff allows you to do is actually tonight. create uh, experiences which aren't necessarily possible as well. So, you know, this sort of stuff, section? these days, isn't too big deal, but even going back 10 or 15 years, you know, something like this probably wouldn't be possible oh, because yes. is this is it. enormous and painful. Is Paul here yet? Huh. Hey, dude, how's it going? You wanna go check out that new place I was telling you about? Sure. This truck's really good. Hey, just a second. Cool. Good to see you again. Thanks, man. It's got a new place, not that city. See you, dude. So, yeah, a slightly higher fidelity, but again, it allows us to prototype something before we've built it to test the, the user experience. You know, this could be shared with clients to see if what we're building is what they're expecting. Um, it can be shared amongst the team to sort of say, oh, well, you know, what happened if, you know, there was no internet connectivity, how does the system react there, and sort of start looking for, for issues that may arise at a later date. Um, this is, I, I always find this an amusing video, being someone who works in augmented reality, this is the, the horror So when we all have AR, high uh, tech lenses and can't really turn this sort of stuff off. So obviously this is quite a high fidelity thing. Someone spent a lot of time doing this, but what they're showing here also wouldn't be possible with current technology. Even you know the latest and greatest magic leap, magic, uh, magic leap um, displays or the hologram and stuff can't really do what we're seeing here. But they're imagining this dystopian future. Good. Now get the skim milk from the refrigerator. To help you so the, the person who did this video did a, another one. <laughs> Absolutely, you're drowning in it sort of thing. But, you know, allows them to, to prototype out. This, I think, was meant more as a warning message than a prototype necessarily. But, um, you know, again, shows a, shows a way of exploring an idea without ever actually building the idea. And... Exploring the idea in a way that is very uh, easily digestible by people. You know, we can see this and understand what this must be like rather than just some guy going, oh, 
in the future there'll be advertisements everywhere. You're like, well, there already is advertisements everywhere. You know, it's on the radio, it's on the TV. And he's like, no, but I mean literally everywhere. Um, so showing you that, you can be like, oh God, this is, this is a horrible future that we have in store for us. Okay, so role playing in Wizard of Oz um, is sort of a similar thing. Well, in some ways shares a lot of aspects with video prototyping, but it's a bit more freeform. Um, so role playing allows you to, well, role playing at least, allows the user to experience a solution in a realistic context. Role playing can allow you to evaluate non-tangible parts of the solution or gain greater, gain greater empathy with the user. And not all problems or solutions result in a product. So I talked about the idea of prototyping, uh, role playing prototyping with the, um, that group of students who was doing their project around the robots and how had they done some role playing and actually got out there, someone pretending to be a robot, they could have very quickly realized what was, was and wasn't going to be possible um, rather than just assuming, oh, the, the robot can do speech recognition, let's use speech recognition. The robot speech recognition doesn't work so well when there's 30 kids yelling at it or when there's a massive big diesel generator right next to you. Um, but for more, here's a, another example which shows uh, an example of role playing, um, which is, you know, Quite a good way of sort of prototyping a, a so this is you know a Siri or what time do I have to meet Google time? Assistant style thing Let's for do in the your detour. car. He doesn't mind if I'm late. Okay, recalculating. Brooke, would you like to call Tim and let him know? Oh no, not for just five minutes. He'll be okay. Okay, Tim is calling you. Would you like to take his call? Hey, what's going on? Running a little bit late today. There's an accident. A likely story. Can you pick up a coffee for me on the way? Oh, a coffee out here? I'm not really from around here. I can find out where a coffee is. What do you want? I'll take a uh, tall vanilla caramel macchiato Okay. from Starbucks. My car recorded that, but I sure forgot what you said. Coming up. Okay, <laughs> cool. DeSoto Public Library, McDonald's of DeSoto. Are there any sales at McDonald's? What's, what's on the menu? <laughs> McRib is back. <laughs> <laughs> Walmart blender, seventeen dollars. Um, and how far is that? Three miles. Also on sale at Walmart. Orange juice. Oh, that's right. My wife didn't want me to pick up orange juice. Um, after I go to Walmart, send me to Tim's Gun Shop so I can get my knife sharpened. Tim's Gun Shop closed on Sundays. Dang it. Okay. Um, save that to my to-do list for Monday, please. Sure. Saving sharpen knife on Monday. Cut. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's a few things in there which I think are, are quite neat. So they were really trying to push, like especially when she is on the phone to her friend, boyfriend, husband, whatever, and he's ordering a ridiculous drink and she's trying to remember it and she's like, oh, that's okay, my car recorded it. So immediately, you know, that might not have been something that you may have thought would be useful. You'd be like, oh, we want this car assistant, it can read GPS for our lady to answer phone calls. And then immediately by done that, with running through these examples and just playing around with the idea, she's like, my car recorded. And it's like, okay, there's a new feature. We need to make sure that the car can record and play back stuff because when you're driving, um, you know, you end up with information overload. She, she says she's in a place that she's not familiar with. So she's already got the extra load of trying to figure out where am I, where am I going, what am I doing and all this stuff. And one thing um, which is which I find kind of interesting, and you know, you could, they, they could have set up more, this could have actually been done in the car, probably a good idea to start not doing it in the car to start with, because one thing which is kind of interesting is, story. as she's going a along, a lot of the time oh, she's wobbling the steering oh, well, wheel, so yeah, she's at least really pretending. When this guy um, gets behind the wheel, um, he's completely that? mentally overloaded, Pretty he's just like, yeah, he's not even looking forward. He's, you can tell his focus is completely elsewhere. So in this case, you know, you're looking at this use case of now something that is supposed to make his life easier has actually made it way harder because he's, you know, mentally he's trying and, you know, she's the, the, as the computer, she's like, oh, something else which is set on sale at Walmart, orange juice. And he's like, oh yeah, that's right. My wife asked me to get orange juice. While it was nice that it reminded him, it sort of shows place to the fact that he is massively mentally overloaded and probably shouldn't be driving because his attention is, you know, he hasn't even moved the steering wheel. He's just holding it and looking like that. So, you know, perhaps this is another consideration we need to look at. 
is this virtual assistant actually making him less safe? You know, you think, oh, virtual assistant that you talk to is better than being on your phone because at least you're looking at the road. But in this case, it's taken so much of his attention that he's not even paying attention to driving anymore. So you need to start thinking, well, okay, how can we look out and make sure that that isn't going to happen? Wizard of Ozing is something that sort of is similar to role playing, and this, but this is something that we use quite extensively at the lab, and it's a really good tool um, for uh, you know designing often quite difficult to build to, to prototype often quite difficult concepts. So in Wizard of Oz prototyping, uh, a real person does the work of the system unbeknownst to the user. So has everyone seen Wizard of Oz, the original? Yeah. So in that, there's the scene where they, they finally meet the wizard and they go on and there's this giant floating scary head and then Toto, uh, Dorothy's little dog, pulls back this curtain and there's actually this tiny little man sitting operating a computer um, that is actually the big wizard. And the whole idea is that, you know, it's supposed to be this big god-like figure but it actually turns out it's just a man on a computer who's controlling it. And in a Wizard of Oz study, that's essentially what we're doing. You're interacting with some system, but what you actually don't realize is there's actually somebody sitting hidden away who was actually the system. Uh, so it allows us to fake functionality, which saves time, so we don't actually have to build a system, um, which is exactly what, with the, uh, the students who did the robot thing, that's actually what they ended up doing, was Wizard of Ozing it. As I said, they had uh, someone who was sitting there on a laptop pretending like they weren't involved with the system and when the kids, like the robot would say, what is your name? And the kid would say something and that person would type their name into the computer and then the robot would respond, hello, child's name. And so for the child, they didn't realize because this person just was sitting there like doo -doo 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 on their laptop, but really they were actually controlling the, controlling the robot and gave the kids this seamless experience that, hey, actually we're, we're interacting with this robot. Um, so yeah, the user thinks they're interacting with the computer, but they're responding to an output. The developer is responding to the output. So I had a, a PhD student um, that is, he did his PhD in natural interaction and augmented reality. So you wear a set of glasses and you are interacting with virtual content with your hands effectively. Uh, and he, this is, you know, there's a lot of systems now which can do that, uh, but he was sort of testing it before a lot of these systems were mature. So how do you, how do you test something, a technology which doesn't actually exist? And he was doing a, basically wanted to come up with this vocabulary of gestures which would work in AR. So if you're working in AR and you want to do some scene authoring, you want to create some virtual objects, move them around, stuff like that, we're talking about things you can't touch. How do, you, how do you do that? How do I, I, I put on my headset and I see a cube floating in front of me, I can't actually touch that or do anything, so what, what gestures would I use with my hands in order to do that? And so what he did is he Wizard of Oz the whole thing. So he had people wear a headset and displays and he had all these cameras around set up and told people, you know, uh, this system is really amazing and it can detect what you want to do. And so what I want you to do is, I have a set of tasks for you. So uh, you will see a cube, you'll see two cubes, a red cube and a blue cube, and you need to place the red cube on the blue cube in, you know, using these, using natural gestures. You are allowed to use whatever you want, just do it and the system will understand. And in reality, he had someone sitting in the next room frantically watching these videos and trying to, you know, figure out what these people are doing. And he built up this vocabulary of, you know, a scale gesture, so people would grab the corners of the cube and they would stretch it like that, like you would with a real object. Other people were using a, what he had two different, well he had like something like 13 different metrics, but there was ones, for example, with scaling, it was like a touch and pull, and there was another one which was distance. So I might see a virtual cube and I need to shrink it down, so I grab the corners and I can shrink it or expand it. Or alternately, people might go, oh, it needs to be a bit smaller, and they'd use it rather than like an absolute measurement grabbing the corners. They might say it needs to be a little bit smaller, and they would expect that, you know, as they move their hands together, it would shrink. And so it's not an absolute measure, but it's a, a relative one. And so he was able to, I think he ran through like 50 people or something, and then from that went through, codified all their responses and came up before there was really good sort of hand tracking and stuff for natural gestures, he was basically able to come up with this vocabulary that 
if you are designing a natural hand thing, these are the gestures you need to be able to recognize. You need to be able to recognize a pinch and grab. You need to be able to recognize people's palms so that when you design these systems, you can design specifically to make sure that it supports that. So we'd almost sort of gone, worked around the technical problem to basically say, okay, engineers, this is what you need to solve. Um, so why Wizard of Oz? Allow clients, users, designers to understand design by directly experiencing it before it exists. Goal of persuading audience, compelling, functional, visionary. So um, yeah, first one, obviously they understand the design if they get to interact with it, even before you built it. Uh, you want to persuade the audience, so you want to make something compelling. So his, his thing, like I tried it, was really cool. You wear this head mount display, you see, you know, see this cube floating there, whatever you do, it works. It's amazing, but in reality it's just some poor intern that he had in the background with a keyboard and mouse frantically trying to understand what people were doing and interacting. Um, but you know, it, was fun it felt functional because as far as you can tell the system, whatever you do, the system understands and works. And it was quite visionary. It's you know, looking at technology that doesn't actually exist anymore. Um, and it's especially important for new technology types, digital cameras, wearables, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I might just, we'll make this our last slide for today. So, for example, IBM text-to-speech. Um, this is something, you know, text-to-speech is something that we're all familiar with. It was supposed to revolutionize things. And outside of like Alexa, Siri, and stuff like that, nobody ever uses it. You know, people, everyone out here is using a keyboard and mouse. Nobody's talking to their computer. Why is that? So, IBM was testing this. Uh, they put potential customers of the speech-to-text system, people who said they'd definitely buy it. So these are people who were already sold on the idea in a room with a computer box, a screen and a microphone, but no keyboard. And they told them they had built a working speech to text machine and wanted to test it and see if people liked using it. When the test subject started to speak into the microphone, the words appeared on the screen almost immediately and with no mistakes. The users were impressed. It was too good to be true, which as it turns out, it was. What was actually happening and what makes this such a clever experiment is that there was no text, speech to text machine, not even a prototype. The computer box in the room was a dummy, and the room next door was a skilled typist listening to the user's voice from the microphone and typing the spoken words and commands using a keyboard, the old-fashioned way. Whatever the typist entered on the keyboard, it showed up on the user's screen. The setup convinced the user that what was appearing on the screen was the output of the speech-to-text uh, machine. Here's what I heard. After being initially impressed by the technology, most people who said that they would buy and use a speech-to-text speech machine changed their mind after using the system for a few hours. Even with fast and near-perfect translation simulated by a human typist, using speech to enter more than a few lines of text into a computer had too many problems. Among them, people's throat would get sore by the end of the day, it created a noisy work environment, and it was not suitable for confidential material. So effectively, by paying a skilled typist for you know, a week's worth of, you're going to sit here and type out what people say, they probably saved themselves millions of dollars engineering a speech-to-text speech -to system that would have ultimately been a massive flop and probably, you know, the millions of dollars of engineering it would have been wasted because no people would have bought it and then been like, this is rubbish, I'm not using it. And, you know, so by paying a few hundred dollars or maybe a couple of thousand dollars for somebody's time up front to Wizard of Oz this, they were able to avoid an extremely costly mistake down the line. And again, this is something that the, the robot thing could have, they could have avoided spending all this time building these things which relied on speech recognition by just Wizard of Ozing it to start with. Cool. So let's stop there. I think we only have, yeah, we only have a few slides um, to cover next week. Uh, but I just wanted to talk quickly about what your first assignment will be. So I will try and get this out to you. Uh, so I put, I have been putting the lecture slide, well, the one lecture slide that we've had so far on Learn, and I will put your, the assignment on Learn. So if you go to Learn and go through the Hit the 603-2019 semester one. You'll see topic one is on there. I'll put topic two today, but I'll put the uh, first assignment up. I'll try and get it up by uh, end of tomorrow. You have basically, I think we the way we've sorted out the weeks, um, so you have four weeks of lectures, then thesis week, four weeks of lectures, then there's a, a holiday, and then a thesis week, and then four weeks of lectures, and then that's that's it. Um, so basically it'll be due the end of week four, so you have three whole weeks to work on it. So Niels and, I talk, Niels and I talked about this, and we basically wanted an assignment which would stretch across the low fidelity prototyping, the software prototyping, and the hardware prototyping. And I've already given a few hints 
to it. Um, but basically what you will be designing is a training tool in VR or AR, um, which will allow, you know, it's, it's the first steps towards basically a training tool for some task. So that task could be, and I know this is quite relevant to you, and a few other people have had mentioned it as well, but um, you know, you can think of it as being a training tool for whatever. So I read a paper recently which was looking at virtual reality training for um, aircraft engineers, uh, people who have to in uh, thousands of bolts on an aircraft, and they need to do it properly because otherwise you, the panels just blow off the aircraft and everybody dies. And it's very time consuming, it's very strenuous, um, it's extremely monotonous. Uh, you need to, when you're doing these training simulations, you need to make sure that they're being evaluated. So not only do you have someone going along doing all the rivets and stuff, you have to then get somebody going along behind them checking that they're doing it properly because if they're not, then you know you go, yeah, great, you've done your training and then they go off and suddenly the wing falls off a plane. So what you guys are gonna be doing is, for your three assignments is the first steps towards that. It won't be any, anything near that complicated. It will be more like what I just described, um, FAM, the PhD students, uh, thing of you have two cubes and you need to align one with the other. So you have your ideal situation and then you have your starting situation and you need to find some way of making sure that they're aligned, you know, their position, their orientation, their scale. Uh, we haven't specifically said whether it is in VR or AR because there will be a slight aspect of that, but it's not really pertinent because the only difference between VR and AR is whether you can see, in this case, is whether you can see the real world behind it or not. Um, but for your first assignment, it will basically be looking at some low fidelity prototyping methods for you guys can pick whatever training thing you would like. It could be aircraft engineering, it could be medical, so you're training people to do medical operations in VR or AR, so you're not just saying, get this drill and start, or get the saw and start cutting into people, but instead you do it in virtual reality. So you, you guys pick whatever topic you'd like to do, and then you're going to look at what aspects uh, are important in, in your field. So in medical, you know, you wanna make sure that people, are obviously, well, probably across all of them that are doing the job correctly, but in medical, it's probably, if you're using a, you know, some sort of scalpel or something, a couple of mils difference could be the difference between somebody living and somebody dying. So it's obviously very important that it's highly accurate and you know we can get that couple of mils. If it's you know putting rivets into an airplane, as long as the rivet ends up in the right place, it doesn't matter if you're sort of like, oh, 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 there we go, it's in, it's in the hole. So you know, two various, very different things. So I'll put the, the assignment handout up either, or by the end of tomorrow, which we'll talk about the various bits and pieces you have to do. But really the first part will just be deciding on what topic you would like to do and doing a bit of an investigation, talk, trying to figure out what parts are important, what parts aren't, doing some low fidelity prototyping around that. You know, you'll do some sketching and uh, paper prototyping. You might choose to do some video prototyping, some role playing, some Wizard of Ozing. Um, I'll, I'll get all that put down and you know get the thing uh, out to you guys and then you know you, either you can email me if you have any questions or we can talk about it on Tuesday before the or at the start of the lecture. But does that sound good? Anyone have any questions about it at the moment? Is it an individual assignment? So it will be you will we'll all have to submit a your your work. But I mean, brainstorming, prototyping, and stuff like that is typically a group group activity. So, I mean, ideally, I would love if all of you picked a different thing. So, you know, we had medical, we had aircraft engineering, we had deep sea drilling, we had you, you name it. Everyone does a separate thing. But there's no reason, even if you're doing separate things, that you can't work together and sort of say, well, in my thing, I need to do this, and can we brainstorm and prototype and everything around that, and then. For someone else's thing, they can do you know the same thing. So you can work in groups, but at the end of it, you will be submitting your own assignment with your own bits and pieces around it. Any other questions? Like, what's the what stage that you have to do the programming thing? No. So not for for assignment one. You all you will be doing is basically depending on what prototyping methods you choose to use. You might be, you know, uh, taking scanning or taking some photographs of some sketches. You might put together a video prototype. 
You might choose to do a Wizard of Oz thing like you saw with the guys with the car navigation or anything. So you would include a video. There'll be certain aspects that you have to do and then there'll be like a choose some prototyping things that you think are helpful and, you know, do basically do them and supply, depending on what you supply, what you choose to do will be, depending on what you supply, it might be videos and photographs. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. So you've, I mean, you'll have three weeks to do this, which normally they, the students got two weeks. So you got a bit more time as well because of the way that the breaks and stuff fell. It's, it's actually really convenient that it's sort of three weeks of four. All right, sorry, we went a little bit late, but you've still got time if you're running. <laughs> cool. And I'll put those slides online, and yeah, by the end of tomorrow, that first draft. If anyone has any questions, um, let me know.